mentioned, right, that we are all in that comfort zone and there is this stage of, you know, fear before we get to that stage of growth. And the stage of fear is almost debilitating, right? If when you're there or when you've left behind everything that's familiar and that stage of growth is nowhere visible, right? Like it's like you're lost at sea and you're in search of that land <laughs> to really survive and get there. Uh, how have you managed situations where you've been in that space of, you know, out of comfort zone, nowhere near growth? Uh, how do you really handle the emotions and the insecurity, self-doubt, and probably all the critics uh, coming up in our head and still acting towards those goals and desires? So I think, you know, one is challenged constantly. And like I said, if you if you take a path which is a path of expansion, constantly challenging yourself to grow, uh, it does mean that you have to let go constantly of who you were before to become who you are meant to be in that next stage of your life. And uh, for me, I think, I would say the toughest example of this really was when I gave birth to my son mm -hmm. and uh, he came a full one month before schedule. So, mm -hmm. so you know, I mean, I don't even think we had really bought his clothes because I was just trying to tie in everything at office. Uh, it was a time where I was growing in my career and the organization that I was in was also going through a pretty tough turnaround situation. So uh, things were challenging there. Um, a lot of, you know, hard work, critical decision making, tough choices. So in every way, uh, emotionally, physically, I would even say mentally, spiritually, I mean, we were stretched making that turnaround happen. It was tough. It was also tough and challenging because a lot of us were very young and this was perhaps the first time that we had encountered that critical situation in the business and understood the importance of really quickly working on a turnaround situation, how important it is to save lives, to save careers, to save reputation. All of it, the stakes were really, really high. And uh, and this was an absolutely new situation. So there was no playbook I could open up and, and read as to what do I do next? Because every day was a new day. And it called upon us to be the best leader that we could be in the, that situation. And uh, here I was in that professional frame. And then the baby came a full month ahead of time. Uh, and when you have a premature baby, then, you know, you need a lot more care. Um, and, and nobody prepares you to be a mother, really, honestly. You can read all the books you want. And those were not the days of the internet where Google uh, came to the rescue for virtually everything. So for every little cough, every time the fever shot up, uh, you know, the temperature shot up and he had high fever, I panicked, right? And and coincidentally, that also happened to be the day I had a travel scheduled or, um, you know, a big meeting in the office or the global CEO was coming in. So how do you really look at integrating both these realities of your life and you are not prepared for either of them? Yeah. yeah? And you get them both together. together. <laughs> so after a while, you're like, okay, okay, bring it on. <laughs> you, know? you have no other and choice. <laughs> no other choice. And, and yet, you know that somewhere in your heart, you know that this is also going to be the most fulfilling time of your life. Imagine if you could emerge out of this stronger and you could be in your capacity, whatever your version that you can be of the best mother to that little boy. And you can be a leader to the team that the team needs at that point in time. Uh, how fulfilling would that be? And I think just, just even that thought uh, on many sleepless nights uh, kept me going. And uh, of course, we emerged out of it. The company not just turned around, but became a huge um, profitable uh, contributor to the worldwide business, a big, uh, powerful, well-reputed brand in the country. And on the other side, I was really happy to see my son and the way he was growing and um, and how independent he was and how, um, how much love and respect he had for the work that I was doing. So, um, so I think it, it just gave me so much joy at a later date. 
But at that point in time, I think it just sucked everything inside of me and how. So, um, so the idea is to really tap into your strength. And we have oodles of it. There is that reservoir, the secret reservoir we all have. Mm-hmm. Um, and the idea is to tap into it when you most need it and take liberally. And, and then to give back to it liberally when you have an extra of that energy of all of the good fortune that life has given you. In today's race for more, right? if I can put it that way, we are always craving for something more, whether it's status, wealth, uh, designations, whatever it is, right? Uh, how can we really balance that ambition while being content? There are two, three layers to it. In Sanskrit, it's called Vishayananda and Atmananda. Vishayananda means the happiness that the objects bring to you. Nothing wrong in it. Nothing wrong. Okay. Uh, Vishayananda would be ice cream. I eat ice cream. I feel happy. Done. Finish. But again, fleeting. It gives me sugar high, then my insulin spike happens and then after one hour I'm like, oh, I want one more ice cream, things like that. So it, the vicious cycle never ends. The second is Atmananda. The Ananda, bliss or happiness that comes from within. We have gotten lost too much in the Vishayananda. Because nobody told us about Atmananda. Our education system, our social ecosystem has always been about Vishayananda. Even we ask our kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? Doctor, engineer? Has anybody ever told you as a child, just be a good person? Just be happy when you grow up. Doesn't matter what you do in life, just be happy. Nobody told me that. So we've been we've been taught that the only ananda, the only happiness that exists is Vishayananda. But our scriptures teach us very differently. Chapter 2 of Bhagavad Gita says this. So there is a very big gap between what our scriptures say and what we are actually doing. So somewhere we have to go back to this realization by realizing that pursuing the objects, Vishaya, is at own, its own thing. We need that. I'm not saying you should give up all desires and not like that. But not at the cost of the Ananda that is there with you. In this sense, we all have to harmonize our external pursuits and internal pursuits. So, I mean, you would have seen a lot of women's challenges, uh, you know, through uh, solving for in the uh, flexibility. So, just curious, what are the most common challenges women probably face in their careers and what do you think uh, can help them navigate it? Um, so yeah, the top ones are um, which can actually halt a career are uh, these things like uh, relocation, uh, owing to marriage, uh, then uh, maternity, caregiving. So these are the things which actually cause uh, dropout. So this is like a, it's not a question of just navigating a career. It's like a question of having a career. So it's, um, I think these, these play a very important part in our, in our society and culture where, um, um, where there is a lot of conditioning around what roles men have to do, women have to do, and uh, um, the roles that we grow up with and we get conditioned to uh, incorporate and uh, do better at. Uh, so that's one, one big reason. 
and yes of course the constructs in which work itself happens right so it has to happen from this location that location which has opened up a little bit now post pandemic and uh, caregiving and uh, uh, the support available to raise a family so these are all uh, big factors actually which which have a significant impact on a, a woman's career so uh, yeah there are no easy answers so there i mean solutions have to be built from from the institutional economic to family and welfare to the individual right so and there are multiple organizations uh, chipping away at uh, at all of these issues which impact women's careers so flexibilis way is choosing one particular way like one one small part we have chosen and uh, which is to build flexible careers so that is that is our way to solve for uh, 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 women who find it hard to uh, 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 sustain in this full time grind basically and that has been uh, working for a, a large segment of women um other ways could be having a um, uh, family friendly policies and more inclusive cultures which which help sustain that career right and um, and have a equal opportunity for both parents to bring their whole selves to work right as 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 their as their parents as well as as their professionals um so yeah there are a host of solutions possible and yeah so this our way has been to find flexible work which which can help uh, uh, parents and those who need flexibility uh, navigate the challenges of managing everything yeah that's true and i think one of the things that you told me also stood out for me saying that uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, for women coming back from maternity also is to regain their confidence right and i think as a coach i also meet a lot of women you know who taken break for maternity and maybe you know not just for one child one child you know they wanted to have two children over a break and you know before you know it it became 5 7 years and 10 years and suddenly they feel out of relevance right in the industry yeah. uh yeah how how do you think uh, women can actually regain their confidence if there are listeners here in our audience as well who are probably in their break yeah. or planning to get back or are already back but don't really feel as confident mm-hmm. as they used to uh how can sure. they get that confidence back yeah yeah so um yeah confidence is at one stroke a big area as well as a solvable things so i think one is for we have to look at it as um as a as a host of things basically so why why first of all we lose it is um so when we are working right there is so much so much we do around work we don't realize it so we are in that in that mode where we are in a work think kind of mode right so we go to the office we or or whatever we engage with others we talk about work issues we talk about the functions and then we know what what is happening outside of the company in that industry and within that company why certain things are done then you have a support system around work right you have you have peers whom you can consult with talk with so um, and of course financial independence there are so many elements which are integral to our identity in work right so we are in that mode without realizing it so when that thing is taken away or when you have to give up on work so this all of these things go away at one shot right so the transition that happens in life due to work going away is a very big transition so it's a financial transition it's an emotional transition it's an intellectual transition right because you are used to thinking work issues and solving work problems and work crises and all of that and suddenly there is a big void where that used to exist right so 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 your naturally your mind struggles it, it doesn't channelize um uh, the brain is not channelized in the way it used to be right so something else occupies it but there's a big big segment which is which is missing so um i think then the solution also is to get all of these back little by little so um so we have kind of uh, built a framework called i rise in we which we talk about uh, to uh, women uh which can help them come back to the career uh, so like i stands for introspection right so we say uh, take a look at what all you have done you yourself have done right so you look at your past resume look at your appraisal papers then talk to your peers whom you work with your colleagues whom you work with so then you will get reminded of the things that you did 
so then you realize that you only did that it's not somebody else it may feel like it's someone else because a year of motherhood can feel like a decade of another lifetime right so it can feel like that but it's you who did that so and all of that you had is not going away anywhere it's still inside you so that itself gives a little bit of confidence first of all taking stock introspecting and seeing what all you have done what skills have you actually possessed which skills you were most proud of which you were most happy to engage and which were you did because you job had to be done and you were not very very happy about using those skills so i think the first element is to take stock which was i then um, r stood for research so research about um, your function your industry where things are going the economy so um, if you are an accountant you might like to uh, visit the um, uh, 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 visit the government or statutory um, uh, groups where there will be updates about what is happening if you are a marketing professional you might want to go to industry associations or Uh, networking groups and have uh, and understand what's going on so research about all of these elements also helps you keep in touch then again you get back the thinking mode about work oh okay this industry is going in this way and then if this kind of well, how will they address these kind of problems or this these kind of marketing challenges are coming up how will they answer so i think uh, basically they the 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 kind of thinking kind of comes a little by little back right um then uh, i rise i stands for interact interact is again with your colleague ex bosses uh friends so there's so many people um, whom uh, we have place they they do all of this so it's not like they do like a course oh i will do this and this and this so we know that those who are successful have done a combination of all of this in their attempt to come back so so if i look at it in the context of your audience today shweta as you said a lot of them are very keen to build their personal brands um and if i am say in a service based um business or i'm wanting to build my personal brand as a business owner or as a corporate professional either ways connecting back with your purpose and helping to reveal that is important but when we say purpose let's not just talk about the word purpose which simon sinek has made you know famous everybody understands that in theory and we were chatting about it right sometime back as well but how do you really put it in action so how do you make it concrete so that it means something to you so i think the first thing is to really sit down with yourself and the starting point is our values and again many people omit that step right they they want to jump straight into whatever they've learned as a template and i'm not a believer of just filling up templates because that's the cool thing to do mm-hmm. i think we have to really go back and look inside of us as to what do we really value as as a corporate professional or as a business owner uh what are the things that are really important to us what are our non negotiables in life mm-hmm. and in business right and when we start to list those down i think you start to see a pattern and and th- from those values you know really will will emerge your purpose because then your purpose is about your own existence that why do i exist right the next question is for whom do i exist because purpose is not really something you do in isolation it's not just for you the many people think it's about me and and one fine day i'll know what to do with my life this one life which i'm so confused about but that aha moment when it comes you'll realize it always involves an audience mm-hmm. right even if you have to build a personal brand a brand seen by whom admired by whom important to whom right so there's there's always the other at play so so we have to realize that we are all born with a purpose every single one of us and that's the why behind our existence but for whom is a very important question and if you start to define that uh, in as much detail as possible that's really a very essential step in building your personal brand and and the last step really is that why should those people really care that you exist mm-hmm. and and when you are able to make meaning 
of this last bit that's where you truly shift the focus from me to we to us and and that holds true for a corporate leader who leads a business who leads a team right who even leads him or herself and brings themselves to work every day you could be inside an organization equally works for someone um, who is a business owner you could be a solopreneur you and your business are the same so so your purpose and perhaps many times the purpose of what you start as your venture is so intertwined yeah right and what we cannot neglect is that who are we for and how do we really serve them so this whole question of serving it's not just for people like mother teresa mm-hmm. yeah and neither do we all need to become a mother teresa so so that's where i want to make it concrete that even if you can make really amazing chocolates and then that's your business mm-hmm. you make people happy because when they eat chocolate they they are happy and then you do that with love you do that with a sense of purity choose the best ingredients mm-hmm. um that that could very well be your purpose and i realized one truth which is my truth that is put your best and leave the rest and when you are not worried about the outcome it's all about what you're putting in currently you end up doing your 100% when you are nervous or anxious about the result you actually end up making a lot more flaws so when the result does not matter i'm going to put my best shot and the rest is up to whoever destiny god whatever you call it then it becomes easy to do your work as well you put in your first foot you know that that's the beauty of it you just take one step the universe we call it universe now the generalized term takes the remaining 99 steps to make sure everything falls in place so when things work your favor how many times do you look up and say thank you when they don't how many times you look up and say why me? why <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. i think the moment all of this gave clarity to me it became easy to accept all that happened but one thing remained doing your best putting in that hard work doing whatever because uh, one truth i had picked from there was never look back and say i wish i had worked harder i wish i had put in little more effort so that was one principle that i took from the gita that i'll never look back with regret of maybe another one person would have made it yeah so that was one of the biggest moments where this verse started making so much sense to me and i realized there is no point justifying it to those people who are making their statements they are not going to learn anyway they are not going to agree anyway and the gita is not about argument it's about what you take from it and move forward so that's my biggest take away from the gita and uh, that has helped me a lot especially because of competition ambition and goals that you set for yourself and when they don't come true so you're not able to be there but today when i look back i'm happy with the way life threw choices at me and what i picked i had the right mentors at the right time guiding me to who i am today so i know everything happens for a reason